Good afternoon. I'll call this meeting to order. This is the meeting of the Housing Policy and Development Committee. I'm chair of the committee, Cam Gordon. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Jeremiah Ellison, Vice Chair, Kevin Reich, Lisa Bender, and Jeremy Schrader. Uh, we're a quorum of the committee, so we can conduct our business. There are seven items on our agenda. We have a public hearing and two discussion items, and there's four items on our consent agenda. I'll move our consent agenda items first. I'm going to pull number three because I know there's a staff direction for it. So I'm going to move two, four, and five. Number two is a uh, contract with Neighbor Works Home Partners and Buildworth, Minnesota to provide lending administration services for our 2018 Home Ownership Opportunity Minneapolis program. Item four is approving revisions to the guidelines for our Minneapolis NOAA Preservation Fund. And item five is receiving and filing a report on our 4D pilot initiative results. Um, it is our results report. I'm uh, just going to note that we're going to be hearing some recommendations in a couple months on what the 4D program will be for next year. So uh, any anybody want to pull or comment on any of those items? Council Member Schrader. Sure, I just want to comment briefly on uh, number four and five, like just to commend CPED for their work, especially on the NOAA preservation. Like the, all of these things would be great to just hear about at the committee. I know we've got a packed, packed agenda, but just want to make sure to call out um, the great work on that. Um, and also for the 4D program, um, a couple things just looking forward to October when we kind of have the next vision of that. Um, I really like the thought and how the pilot went. Um, the things that stuck out for me, I'd really love to see more integration with kind of the environmental programs that we're offering. Um, also, I, I love the thought about what um, apartments, what tier they're in. Like, we're, we want to be rewarding the, the landlords that are doing the most work. And one thing I want to highlight was some landlords, we were making sure that they were in the best property, their tier one. They also own tier three. So that might be another consideration to make sure that all of their properties are coming into the, the highest form of compliance with the city. Um, and also just want to highlight in the, the governor's task force um, final report just came out this week and highlighted exactly what we're doing, what uh, CPED is doing here. So I also just wanted to commend them on that. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we'll make sure that <clears throat> interested council members can weigh in on the recommendations as they come forward in October. Seeing nothing else then on those three items, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Motion carries. So now on item three, uh, Council Member Ellison, you have a staff direction? Uh, yes, I would like to move a staff direction for item number three. Um, but just for a little bit of background, um, item number three is the establishment of the Minneapolis Small and Media Multifamily Loan Program pilot. And um, and we got some pretty pointed, I think, criticism about the pilot from community members. Um, I see Bill here in the crowd today, who who I think um, was pretty spot on about the fact that if the city is going to have, um, uh, 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 if we're going to have a goal and a and a and a principle of supporting communities of color and uh, and investing in communities of color, that we should be explicit about that goal, right? Uh, and uh, and I really also want to. Um, thank my colleagues and especially uh, Council Vice President Jenkins for always pushing the council to be explicit about our goals in, in racial equity. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and read the staff direction. Um, I move to direct CPED housing staff to engage with organizations of color to receive input on the implementation of the small, medium, multifamily loan program, including disposition strategies to expand community-based ownership, particularly among neighborhood residents and community-based organizations led by people of color, and to return to the Housing and Policy Development Committee in the first quarter of 2019 with recommended changes to the program guidelines. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments on that? I think it's totally in keeping. Uh, oh, <coughs> welcome, Council Vice President. Yes. Thank you, Chair Gordon, and um, thank you to Council Member um, Ellison for bringing forward this um, this um, amendment or staff direction. Um, I really um, appreciate um, his foresight and really trying to ensure that we are living up to our commitments of, of equity and inclusion and ensuring that our policies um, while they are very well intended, 
you know, we recognize that sometimes they have some unintended consequences that um, really uh, sometimes do more harm than, than good in our communities. And so um, I, I would support this and I encourage um, my colleagues on this committee to support this uh, staff direction as well. Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very supportive of the staff direction and really thankful for Councilor <clears throat> Ellison for bringing it forward. I also wanted to note that in the context of a lot of our work to protect renters, I think that this is an important piece of that overall puzzle. And as we learn more about landlords in our city, we know that a huge majority of the units, the rental units in our city are actually owned by a small percentage of landlords. And then we have many, many landlords that own one to four units. And there's actually a very small number of landlords that own something between four and like a lot. And I think as we go forward in thinking about how to protect renters, we don't want to do anything that decreases local ownership of buildings. And in fact, I think we want to continue to encourage and support local uh, ownership of land, community ownership of land, especially investing in communities of color and supporting ownership. And there's probably a lot of opportunity if we look at the thousands of people who own between one and four units in our city to think about how we might help support those entrepreneurs in becoming that sort of second um, grouping of, of landlords that are owning more units. And that may be a piece of this uh, work. When I met with staff, I had suggested, could we think about doing outreach to these smaller landlords and, and understand are there barriers to them becoming medium-sized landlords and um, and then learning from our smaller landlords, you know, what w might or might not work and the protections that we're thinking about bringing forward in terms of being able to support their entrepreneurship into the future. So I think this aligns really well with all of that package of work that we're doing and I'm really glad to see it go forward as a part of our uh, preservation strategies. I think we have a lot of um, exciting work happening in the overall category of starting to preserve affordable housing in our city. Thank you very much. I um, I actually thought it was unfortunate that we couldn't have this as a discussion item and have it uh, a full presentation about it. I think this is an incredible program um, and it's only going to be made better because of this staff direction as we move forward. But this is an opportunity for us, I think, to preserve some of our most affordable housing in the city and actually build towards more community ownership and perhaps and perhaps tenant ownership of those properties. Also looking at how we can use a land trust so that it's per more permanently affordable. Um, and this is a pilot that I'm going to be very excited to hear about um, the results when we come back and look at it and how we can, how we can do this. Um, Unfortunately, we won't have a full-length presentation today about it, but I encourage those people, and I think there might be some housing policy wonks right here today or maybe watching at home, to, to look at the agenda, to look at this uh, pilot program, and to keep an eye on us um, and make sure that um, it goes well for this first round, and then if we are able to ramp it up in the future, that we do so in a, in a good way. I think we'll vote on the staff direction first. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. That motion carries. And now then on approving the guidelines for this new uh, Minneapolis small and medium multifamily loan program pilot and authorizing the three-year participation agreement with um, the uh, entities in the report. Please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion carries then. Now we've dispensed with our consent agenda and we're ready to move into our first item, which is our public hearing. And I believe Mr. Bauer is going to make a presentation and a report, um, unless it's actually Ms. Ness. You know, welcome. This is on the 2017 HUD Consolidated Annual Performance Evaluation Report. We'll have a presentation and then open the public hearing. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Gordon and committee met members and Council Vice President. My name is Allison Nessie, and I'm in the Intergovernmental Relations Department, which is responsible for drafting and submitting to HUD both the annual consolidated action plan, which outlines the city intended use of our entitlement funds and sets the goals for our HUD funded projects and programs. The entitlement fund programs are the community development block grants, emergency solution grants, home investment partnerships program, and housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. We also annually draft and submit the consolidated annual performance and evaluation report referred to as the CAPER, which is before you in its draft form today. Um, we're about 
97% done with the draft. Um, we're still adding information. On August 29th, we will be submitting the caper to HUD. And um, just a reminder, the caper is not a policy document. It strictly outlines how the city spent our entitlement funds and provides the outcomes of the projects and programs of our housing and community development initiatives for the program year of 2016, which ran from June 1st, 2016 to May 31st, 20. Um, I'm sorry, CAPER 2017, um, which ran from June 1st, 2017 to May 31st, 2018. Part of the CAPER submission process includes a 15-day public comment period, which we are in the midst of, um, on the draft report, as well as a public hearing. So we ask that you open the public hearing and we will include any comments received today, as well as any received during the 15-day comment period in the final submission to HUD next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Before I open the public hearing, do committee members have any questions? Seeing none then, um, thank you for that nice succinct report. This is a, uh, something we do annually, um, and we also would appreciate any community comments if anybody has any. I don't believe anybody has signed in. Okay, well, I'll open the public hearing, and we'll take comments. Please introduce yourself for the record. My name is Bill English, and the, I am the consulting project director for the North Job Creation Team, an effort building to bring a thousand living wage jobs to North Minneapolis. It is in that context that I appear today uh, at quite a last minute notice. So because this is open to public hearing, I must call attention to this committee that the city's process for notifying communities, particularly underserved communities, is bankrupt. You cannot depend on neighborhood groups, often which have little staff, dysfunctional, to notify the communities of important issues. I learned about this whole policy last Friday. I'd like to think, and perhaps I'm fooling myself, that I'm pretty well attuned. But quite frankly, I visit the city's website maybe twice a year. There's not often much there, and maybe that's I own that. But to depend on notifying neighborhood groups and post it on the city website as adequate communications to underserved communities is foolish if not insipid. It's just not the way to communicate. Your city staff should know we have Insight, we have KMOJ, we have a television channel, we're on a school district channel. There are more ways to communicate with our community and let us know than this one. So as you engage in this public hearing, it is important that the staff pay close attention. I must also bring up one other thing. This whole policy is geared towards de facto discrimination. Let me be very specific. I have nothing but admiration for PPL and Urban Homeworks. But I must assure you that their record is unknown of all of the houses that they have done in the last seven years, this council needs an audit. How many of those have went to people of color? How many? Moreover, how many African-American contractors have they used to conduct this work? These are important issues if the city is truly committed to EDI as it proclaims, and I believe that. I love those organizations, but by default, they act with the privilege they are granted as white institutions. While our few nonprofit organizations of color suffer from a lack of capacity and the ability to engage in meaningful work to distribute the income and make sure our communities, which has the poorest people in the city living in, gets a chance to participate and turn those dollars over into community. I'm not accusing anyone here on this council, in particular this committee specifically, of doing anything inappropriate. Perhaps, if anything, it's out of unawareness. Unawareness that the intended good that you do by default ends up hurting us. I know Urban Homeworks, and I know their good work, but getting Urban Homeworks to work with black churches has been an act of fruition on my part. I could not get them to engage with black churches. They have to answer that question, why? You have to demand that they do, since you give them preference over lots over anyone else. That's real. 
So I ask you to ask your staff, as you engage in staff work, to bring back to you some results that they have achieved, particularly as it relates to communities of color, both in, both in the contracting, both in the results of people ended up in rental and home occupancy. We have a wealth of organizations qualifying people for home ownership, Bill Wealth Minnesota and others, and they have a ready list of candidates ready to purchase home. Even Aon, the, what owns more rental housing units than anybody in the city. When I ask the question, how many black contractors have you used? They can't answer. Now they've done a good job of integrating their rental units with people of color so they can live there, but often they can't work there and perform work on the very houses they end up living in. Not intentional, but by default. The world to hell is paid with good intentions. Good intentions. I would hope that you would do your due diligence as I know this committee. There's nothing but respect I have for this committee. And I call on you to ask for the information so that you can make informed decisions about the results, unintended or not, and how we are not being gentrified. Because if they've sold most of their homes to white people, guess what? Whether intentional or not, you contributed to the gentrification. And I do know the talk in the barbershops, in the beauty shops, and in our churches is that this is intentional. I don't buy that argument. And I say we've been not as diligent as we should be. And I don't know much about housing. Don't pretend to know. I'm focused on jobs. So I'm here today to speak to for Reverend McAfee, who is ill. He had to preach from a sitting down. He has E. coli. I promised to come here for the Coalition of Black Church Ministers that are working on this. They have commitments from Wells Fargo for money, so they don't need to beg the city for subsidy. They can do that, but they want the same privilege as Urban Homeworks and, and um, PPL to select the lots that they want to build on and not be given second choices for things that they don't deserve to do because they clearly are focused on our community. And finally, Portland has demonstrated a project that this city needs to be aware of. Portland has created a process, legal process, that you can give priority. As you know, our community, North Minneapolis in particular, was stricken hard by the tornadoes and the illegal foreclosures. So Wells Fargo has committed dollars for mortgage to the black ministers. And they will work with the national and NARAB, as what they're called, of black realtors. They are also engaged in a collaboration with the black ministers. So we have the capacity. We can build the capacity of our nonprofits to be as effective as any of the two larger ones. I beg you to not fall into the trap of pushing this through. Now, I know you had to do this for 19, because you got to get this money spent by HUD. But why didn't I know that a month ago? Why wasn't staff open about that? So we need to rush this through, but we're going to take time to inform the community. Those are questions that I raise of you. They are not hostile. They're not meant to adversarial. You all know I want a partnership with this city, and I've been engaged in this partnership for the last five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else here to speak on this matter? Seeing no one, then I'll close the public hearing, and I think that makes Mr. English's words even more powerful. Uh, those will definitely be put in the record, and I think they've been burned and etched in the minds of all the committee members up here. I think you're absolutely right. I think we've got some programs going, and we have some abilities to track the city dollars and where they're going, and, and, and others we don't. And you could have, you could be shining, shining a light on something we could do a much better job at. So I appreciate that. Um, seeing no other comments, then I'm uh, prepared to move forward with uh, this, this action, which is authorizing the submittal of uh, our consolidated annual performance and evaluation report um, to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and also directing staff to include um, any comments that we've received, including those today, to be submitted along with the re report to HUD. Uh, and all that's going to take place, I guess, on August 28th, as we heard. Seeing no comments or questions on the motion, then all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. And now we'll move on to our two discussion items. And, 
first item. If I can find my uh, agenda here. There it is. <laughs> is a discussion of our Minneapolis Homes program modifications. Pronounce your name, Kinas. 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 Welcome. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> Excuse me, Chair Gordon. Members of the committee. My name is Kevin Kinas, and I'm a senior project coordinator with CPED. I come before you today with two action items. The first action item is the approval of modifications to the Minneapolis Homes Program Guidelines. And then the second item is approval of the point system for the Minneapolis Homes Development Assistance Program request for a proposal. The City Council approved the program guidelines on February 10th of 2017 for Minneapolis Homes. And the modifications today are for the Minneapolis Homes Development Assistance Program and three home buyer assistance programs that are under that program umbrella. The real estate market in Minneapolis is appreciating at about a rate of 10.5% a year, which means that homes are selling for about $20,000 more each year. This market creates challenges for families um, or the average families in Minneapolis to afford a home in Minneapolis. And this impacts um, a rate of service to households of color due to economic disparities as well. Our current programs serve about 60% households of color um, at our current income guidelines, but we're concerned that the appreciating values may impact that in the future. However, the challenges also create an opportunity to adjust how we provide funding through our programs in order to use it to address the appreciating market. To meet the increased need for down payment assistance and closing cost assistance due to market appreciation, staff proposed updating the home buyer assistance programs, Homeownership Opportunity Minneapolis, Minneapolis Homes Rehab, and Grow North to an 80% AMI borrower from $7,500 to $10,500. Staff additionally proposed modifications to the Minneapolis Homes Development Assistance Request for Proposals process with point changes, including additional points for serving lower AMI households, building denser housing at two to four units, and for uh, developers selecting lots through our neighborhood stabilization program. We're also removing the visible design uh, points as that's now a requirement of the program. The RFP is projected to be released in September of this year with awards to be determined in January of 2019. To align the program with the goals of increasing density on lots and continuing to serve households below 80% AMI, staff is proposing modifications to the Minneapolis Homes Development Assistance Program. Currently, the city provides development gap, which is the difference between the cost to construct a home and what can be sold on the open market. And um, also looking at um, our home buyer assistance that we provide to purchasers, which is the down payment and closing cost assistance that they're eligible for. Staff proposes a change to our model to allow us to use a portion of the development gap for home buyer assistance. That portion of development gap would no longer be needed because the values of the homes are appreciating in this market. And so funds that were previously committed for that development gap could then be used for affordability gap to ensure that households can afford to buy homes that are built through our program. The program or the proposal also includes increasing the max, maximum value gap by 25,000 to proposals that are two to four units on eligible lots and then updating the long-term affordability requirement to 30 years and then continuing to reserve lots in Northeast Minnesota, or Minneapolis and South Minneapolis for long-term affordability. The chart that I have before you depicts um, the maximum value gap that is available um, and then also the affordability gap scenario that's available. So on the left side is the maximum value gap that a developer could access to build a home through this program. 
And then you can see that in both charts, the total gap remains the same. But if you look to the right, if we look at value gap being reduced, we can then increase the affordability gap that's available for projects. So looking at like an 80% AMI project, we may have provided $70,000 in the value gap and $10,000 in the affordability gap. If that value gap is no longer needed, we can then have the home buyer access up to $37,500 of the affordability gap. And I should also note that there was a error on this chart, I think when it was submitted to you and it had $85,000 for the second row instead of 80, so I wanted to make sure that was clear. With that, I'll take any questions that you have. I'm not seeing any questions, but you mentioned something at the beginning about um, uh, people of color getting access to the home ownership through this program. Do we have specific numbers about uh, in the demographics of who the um, home buyers are? Certainly, Chair Gordon. So currently, our program serves about 60% households of color. And when we look at the average um, households of color in the city of Minneapolis, we're about two times service of rates to households of color than the average population. And so do we have that information somewhere that's accessible to other folks? And we can make it publicly could, could available. We, we that, do. That might be good, and even to know what the numbers are, because sometimes we say 60% and it's 12 people or something like mm -hmm. that. So um, it would be interesting to see how many households we're actually talking about. It also might be interesting to see um, where the homes are located. Do we have them? We, and I suspect we know exactly where they're all located and probably have it mapped out. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could, um, I'm not sure how to make that accessible, whether we okay. do it through the agenda report or you do it through your site, but I think that would be interesting information for us to track. And I certainly appreciate that. Thank any you. other committee members have any questions or comments? I don't see any then. Thank you for the presentation. I think Thank you. Um, um, I'm happy to move this forward then, um, the policy we have <laughs> before you, um, approving the modifications to the guidelines and the point system that we'll be using for the future. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. And that will bring us to our, uh, I think our final item for today, which is our discussion of um, our inclusionary housing report. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair Gordon, members of the committee. Uh, the, for the last 15 years, the city has had an inclusionary housing policy that requires uh, any project, any residential project of 10 or more units that is financially assisted by the city to include affordable units. Um, so that policy has been in place um, for about 15 years. And then um, it was expanded in 2016 to apply to any residential projects of 10 or more units that are built on, on land that is owned by the city. It was um, further expanded in 2017 then to, um, I'm sorry, 2017 is when it was expanded to um, apply to city owned land. In 2016, it was expanded to apply to not just city funding, funded projects, but um, projects that receive pass-through funding, like from the Met Council Livable Communities Act um, fund, for example. Um, so those are the, um, currently the triggers that are in place. And then just most recently in 2018, uh, the, um, the city uh, council approved uh, requiring affordability in projects that receive environmental cleanup funds as well. So those are collectively, to date, the triggers that we have to require affordable housing units in um, residential projects of 10 or more units in the city. Uh, in 2016, um, an inclusionary zoning ordinance was introduced by Councilmember Bender um, and reintroduced in 2018 by Council President Bender um, to further the city's inclusionary housing policy um, to uh, apply to more projects than just the ones mentioned. So to that end, the city engaged Grounded Solutions Network uh, to explore policy options for a potential expanded inclusionary zoning or housing policy. A team of city staff from Community Planning and Economic Development, Housing Division, Long Range Planning Division, Development Services uh, Division, as well as City Attorney's Office and City Finance staff have worked um, closely with the consultants over the last um, many months uh, on, on the report. Um, uh, 
they are here today um, uh, to to give a presentation of, of this work and um, also wanted to note that uh, this work included um, consulting with and receiving input from um, private developers as well as affordable housing advocates and other housing professionals in our industry. The timing of this report and future, um, future work with the consultants is intended to inform uh, a potential inclusionary zoning framework to be considered uh, by the City Council concurrent with the Minneapolis 2040 plan in order to support the affordable housing goals in the Minneapolis 2040 plan. A final complete comprehensive inclusionary housing policy would require more work that we would um, do in 2019 for some kind of adoption um, probably in the mid to late part of 20, 2019. So with that um, brief introduction, I would now like to introduce Stephanie Reyes with uh, Grounded Solutions Network to um, deliver their report. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Reyes. Good afternoon, Chair Gordon and committee members. I'm Stephanie Reyes with Grounded Solutions Network. These are my colleagues, Rick Jacobus and Naaman Freeman. For those of you who are not familiar with Grounded Solutions Network, you can read a little bit about us here. Um, since 2010, we've provided technical assistance to over 50 cities and organizations throughout the country on affordable housing issues, and inclusionary housing is one of our areas of expertise. So here's our plan for today. Uh, I'll start out with a brief background on inclusionary housing, uh, then walk you through the results of our policy analysis and financial feasibility analysis for Minneapolis. Uh, and then we'll walk you through three feasible policy options for an inclusionary housing policy for Minneapolis and tell you which one we think makes the most sense and why. So let's dive in. Under inclusionary housing policies, a certain percentage of housing units in market rate developments are set aside at below market rate prices or rents for lower income households. And this is usually a relatively small percent, maybe 10 or 15% of the units in a development. Why do communities turn to inclusionary housing? Well, there are a few reasons. Uh, one is to balance growth with affordability. So most communities want to see new jobs coming in, new public investment in transit, roads, parks, et cetera. Those new investments, of course, make neighborhoods more attractive and drive up housing prices, which can be most impactful on lowest income residents, longtime residents uh, who face rising rents and displacement pressure. So inclusionary housing is a way to ensure that new development has a role to play sets that expectation that new development can help achieve our equity and inclusion goals as the community changes over time. Uh, another reason communities look to inclusionary housing is to address racial disparities and improve racial equity. Uh, the council adopted this goal among others as part of the Minneapolis 2040 plan and uh, recognizing that housing disparities among uh, people of color and indigenous peoples compared to white people are strongly linked to other disparities, including health, education, and income, et cetera. So inclusionary housing is one of the few policy tools available to address racial disparities by creating and retaining mixed income neighborhoods throughout a city as communities change. Uh, and finally, inclusionary housing can increase resources available for the provision of affordable housing um, by harnessing the power of the market and um, can really produce more affordable housing than could be done with public subsidy alone. So with that, let me jump into our findings from Minneapolis. One of the first questions any community has to ask when they're considering an inclusionary housing policy is should this policy be based on a voluntary and incentive-based approach or should the provision of affordable housing be required for most or all projects? And as policymakers grapple with that question, an important thing to note is what is the legal framework you're operating under? So uh, don't try to read the slide. This is trying to give you a sense of official statuteness. Um, but under Minnesota law, cities in Minnesota are allowed to condition discretionary land use approvals on a developer's agreement to provide affordable housing. And these discretionary land use approvals can be anything from planned unit development approval to a site plan approval, et cetera. And Grounded Solutions Network recommends that Minneapolis use the statutory authority to make that link 
rather than use a purely voluntary and incentive-based approach. Why is that? Well, a couple reasons. Nationwide, uh, we've seen voluntary programs tend to produce significantly fewer affordable housing units than programs which have requirements for some or all projects. In addition to these nationwide results, there are a few reasons why a voluntary policy really wouldn't work given Minneapolis's unique development context. For a variety of reasons, the city uh, has chosen to uh, uh, take an approach to community development that focuses on making it easier to build new homes and new commercial space in places like downtown and near transit, right? They're trying to make a more urban, walkable, people-oriented design. They're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, et cetera. And to achieve those goals, the city has already put in place several kind of best practice planning strategies, including allowing for increased density in those locations and allowing for reduced parking in those locations. Well, the good news is projects that take advantage of those benefits can have a more rosy financial picture, right? You can get increased project revenue if you have more units to rent out, and you get significant cost reductions from the, um, reducing parking. Well, that means that the actions the city has already taken make it financially possible for development to contribute more towards affordable housing under an inclusionary housing policy than they would have without these planning benefits in place. Well, that's all good news. Uh, but I wanted to point out that many voluntary inclusionary housing programs are kind of structured in a way that they hold the base zoning fairly restrictive so they don't allow much density by default, they require a lot of parking by default, and then they only allow developers to access additional density or reduced parking in exchange for affordability. Well, because the city has already implemented those best practice planning strategies, using this kind of approach of a restricted base zoning just doesn't make sense here in Minneapolis. So again, we recommend you use your statutory authority, link the provision of affordable homes to a discretionary land use action, rather than using a voluntary approach. Now let's talk about financial feasibility. And before we get to our results, I just want to give a little bit of context on why are we doing this work? Why are we doing financial feasibility modeling? So in addition to this kind of voluntary versus required question, there are a bunch of other questions that policymakers need to make decisions on for an inclusionary policy. These are four of them. Uh, and financial feasibility analysis can inform the answers to these four questions. What are you trying to get at? What question are you trying to answer with financial feasibility? Well, let me outline a scenario here, the scenario you want to avoid and the scenario you want to get to. So any inclusionary housing policy involves some risk that projects that are feasible to build without the inclusionary requirements, like this example project, may become not feasible with the combination of affordable requirements and incentives offered in your policy. Under a voluntary program, this is not a huge problem, right? Developers will just choose to not take advantage of the voluntary program, not provide affordable units, not use the incentives. They'll build their project anyway. You get fewer affordable homes, but development continues. But under a program with requirements, this first option here is not available. So what you end up is, you know, for projects like this example project that become infeasible, they just don't get built. And if the market is similar, uh, and there are lots of similar projects to this example project, then you're seeing more and more projects not getting built. Well, why does that matter? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, in, uh, by constraining supply further in the face of continued demand, that's not particularly good for affordability. And then the way inclusionary housing policies work is you get affordable units when you get market rate units. That's just kind of how the policy functions. So fewer projects, fewer affordable units. For these reasons, any city that has a policy that's not purely voluntary has to pay close attention to financial feasibility. And what you're trying to achieve is this, right? For most projects, even with your affordable requirements and your incentives, the revenues are still are higher enough than the costs that the projects are feasible and development can move forward. So that's the general concept, and I'm going to turn it over to Rick to talk about our methodology and results. Thank you. Okay. Chair Gordon, council, uh, committee members, um, thanks for having us here. I get to share the numbers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and before I do, I want to just do a little bit of which direction am I? Going? Yeah, a little bit of uh, context setting in terms of what we can't do with these kinds of studies. Um, Stephanie mentioned that the reason we do a feasibility study is to answer the question about 
what the impact of a proposed policy is likely to be on feasibility. But what uh, policymakers often want to know is how much could we require in terms of affordable housing and still have it be feasible. And what you'll see is that we can't fully answer that question because every project is different. The economics are different from place to place, from different sides of the street, different types of projects. What we can answer instead is show us some real realistic examples of actual projects or projects that could realistically be built and then let's look at what the implication of a particular policy is on the feasibility of those projects. We don't have the kind of data that would let us tell you what the average project is. We just have realistic examples. So you'll see that when we show real specific numbers, the numbers we're showing you are, are the right numbers as long as you assume the specific project that we've assumed, but you have to keep in mind at all times that there are lots of other kinds of projects out there in the market. Um, we started this analysis, we actually are building on work that we did in 2016 for the city of Minneapolis. And we did a very thorough uh, feasibility study in 2016. And what we've done this year is really update that study and add to it. So in 2016, we interviewed 17 developers active in your local market. And we looked at the pipeline of projects. And we collected data on rents and sale prices and construction costs and operating costs from third party sources. And we built eight different project prototypes. We rental projects and for sale projects at different levels of density and we put together sort of a sample of here's how the project might work financially and then we held a set of focus groups with developers and with housing experts to give us feedback on did we get it right did these look like real projects we made changes and we came back with a final report we also looked at each of those project types how they might be different in different neighborhoods so we looked at eight different neighborhoods and we said, are the rents higher or lower? Are the land prices higher or lower in these neighborhoods? And we adjusted the basic prototypes to these different neighborhoods. So we had a large number of projects, the hypothetical projects, but projects that were realistic that we were looking at. What we found in 2016 was that uh, in much of Minneapolis, development was profitable and profitable enough to support a reasonable affordable housing requirement, um, but that there were neighborhoods where development was happening in a more modest scale that were what you would consider at risk. And, and what we meant by that was there were neighborhoods where if you imposed even a, a modest uh, affordable housing requirement, you ran the risk of projects that were otherwise feasible becoming infeasible, which is basically how you would get less overall development. <clears throat> and because of that conclusion, we found that you could, you could require a very low affordable requirement basically everywhere. But if you wanted larger numbers of units, the recommendation was to focus on offering incentives in addition to the requirements. Uh, at the time in 2016, we didn't analyze the specifics of what the incentives would work, how they would work, how they would be structured, how much they would be. So we were brought back in this year to look primarily at the incentive side of the picture. What kind of incentive package would go with what kind of requirements package? In order to do that, we had to update the analysis um, so that, you know, we were looking today, uh, but we didn't redo the entire body of work that we did previously because it was a little bit overwhelming to have so many different models. We looked just at three types of projects and all three are rental. And these are the most common multifamily projects in Minneapolis right now. We looked at a wood frame rental project, which is like a five or six story building that's wood with, with a parking podium that's concrete. We looked at a 12 or 13 story concrete uh, mid-rise project, it's more expensive to build. Um, and then we looked at a steel, uh, you know, an, a hypothetical steel project, 200 units, 20 story steel building, costs even more to build, the rents are somewhat higher. And we looked at those three prototypes in, instead of eight different neighborhoods, we clustered the neighborhoods. We looked at them in four different types of neighborhoods. We looked at downtown, uh, what we called strong market areas, right, which um, would be the places where you're seeing a lot of development right now. Uh, what we call emerging market areas, which are places where there's some development, but where rents are significantly lower. And then the last is what we call soft market areas, which is uh, many of the neighborhoods where development is allowed in the planning code, um, but the rents right now are not high enough that you're seeing a lot of building happening. Um, so I don't know if you can, I hope you can see the numbers. Um, but the, 
these are the here are the results. So the first thing we want to talk through is the what what does a project look like in each of those prototypes in each of those places without any affordability requirements, and what we found uh, this year consistent with what we found in 2016 was that you have a number of neighborhoods where development is reasonably profitable, where projects are happening, and where there's a strong incentive for projects to happen. And then you have a few places, which are the emerging market areas, where uh, development is more marginal, where the profitability is more marginal, because the rents are lower, but the costs are really very much the same across the city to build a project. And so as the rents go down, the feasibility of the project declines. So the way we're measuring feasibility here is with a metric called yield on cost. And so it's one of several different ways that you might uh, evaluate whether a project is profitable enough, but it's the one that seems to be most widely used here. And um, what we've said when we came in 2016 was projects that had 6% yield on cost or greater would be projects that were feasible. And yield on cost is just the net operating income divided by the cost to build the project. So you can think uh, if a project is throwing off cash after it pays for all its operating expenses, the amount of cash that, that comes out at the end of the year uh, is, you know, in this example, 6% of what it costs to build the project, then that's, you know, was what we were considering enough. What we've seen over the last couple years is that the yields have come down slightly. So we're seeing projects in the, in the most recent set of projects that we looked at, we saw a number of projects that went, were moving forward with lower yields. And so what we've done here is we've suggested 5.9 as the cutoff for yield. So what we're saying is, Projects that can generate at least a 5.9% yield on cost are likely feasible and are likely to go forward. Projects slightly below that we're calling marginal, and if they go below 5.7, we're saying that they're not feasible at all. And again, remember what I said before about there's a huge range of different projects, so the, the exact cutoff is going to be different for different projects, and it's going to depend a lot on how the units are financed. What I, The way to think about the marginal is that some of the projects in these of this type in this location are likely to go forward and some are not. So if the if the returns are marginal, it takes a somewhat special circumstance to make a project work. And when it's marginal, those special circumstances can be enough. But when we're when we're at a much lower level, even with special circumstances, we're unlikely to see projects go forward. Um, so I just want to say, <clears throat> so what we're doing is we're taking this. Um, baseline, here's, the, here's our picture of feasibility. And again, it's showing some neighborhoods, projects are working, other neighborhoods, projects are sort of working or working some of the time. And lastly, some neighborhoods, development is not happening right now because the projects are not feasible. Then what we're going to do is we're going to test different scenarios for affordability. So the first thing I want to show you is 15% of the units, if we required that 15% of the units be affordable at 60% of median income, this is what happens to the returns for those prototype projects. And you'll notice they're all lower. And you should notice right away that the emerging market neighborhoods no longer have feasible projects at all. So, so what that says is if you were to adopt a 15% requirement, we would expect that in some locations where development is currently happening, you would see significantly less development in the future. Um, another thing to point out that's, I think it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but is the, the time frame here. We're showing numbers, even in the, the downtown and the strong market with a 15% affordable requirement, we're showing projects just barely meeting our feasibility threshold, right? They're, they're you know, they're under six. They're um, feasible and you could, you could do it, but where are we in the market cycle? So one of the things that we heard repeatedly from the developers that we talked to was how rapidly uh, costs have been rising, particularly construction costs and land costs. And um, we looked at the, the study that we did before, and one of the first thing we did when we came to town was we sort of updated the, the cost estimates based on inflation and based on what's happened to construction costs around the country, and then we collected real examples. And what we saw was that your real numbers here have been rising much faster than inflation. The cost of construction has been going up really rapidly. Hopefully you all heard this. Um, the cost of land has also gone up over that period of time. So we're, we're still seeing feasible projects today. And the, the, the goal for this analysis is uh, what, what does a project look like that today is going looking for financing, right? So a project that's looking for financing today is not going to be open for a couple years. Right? But they're already seeing what their construction costs are and already seeing what their financing terms are. If 
construction costs continue to rise, the projects tomorrow will look different from the projects today. And there will come a point where uh, development becomes infeasible. So we're showing you sort of what we think it looks like today, but we're hearing concern about what happens next. Now, um, I want to say we heard that same concern two years ago. We heard <coughs> a lot of uh, concern that uh, Minneapolis had built out the, you know, saturated the market for high-end housing two years ago, and that there was going to be a, a slowdown as a result. We haven't seen that slowdown. What, what's happened, the only reason that developers have been able to pay higher costs of construction over this period of time is because in addition to those costs going up, the rents have gone up, right? The rents have gone up at an equally alarming rate. And the, the projects that are getting built today are higher end projects relative to the market than the ones we looked at in 2016. But just because we've heard this concern before doesn't mean it's not an important concern. There will come a point, for sure, we don't have a crystal ball, we can't say when, but there will come a point where you actually can't keep building at even higher and higher end projects, where the, the market just won't absorb that. And what's likely to happen at that point is that the market will come to a standstill and you'll stop seeing development. What we've seen, unfortunately, is often when a community adopts inclusionary housing, they do it at the peak of the market or close to the peak of the market. And that's because that's when the, the tension is there, that's when the pressure is there, that's when the public wants to see something happen about affordability. But then when the market comes down, there's pressure to lower the requirement or to, to waive the requirement or set it aside. And we've seen a number of cities like uh, try to, it's tempting when you look at these numbers to say, well, let's fine tune our policy and let's charge the most we could right now and then later when the market's softer, we'll lower it, right? We've looked at hundreds of these inclusionary policies around the country, and we haven't found one example anywhere of a city that has successfully timed the market. It's just too much to hope for that you're gonna be able to adjust the policy to sync with the market. So what I take away from that is that in order to make the policy effective, you have to have it work not just at the peak of the market, but across a broader swath of the market cycle. So as the market goes up and down, it works in the middle as well as at the top. And unfortunately, what I think that means is that at the peak of the market, you're leaving a little bit on the table, right? So this is my plea for margin of error. At 15%, we don't see enough margin of error for, for our numbers to be wrong, for this moment in time to be different than typical, et cetera. So we also ran- We might have a question here, just a minute, Council okay. President. You Thank you. I don't, I don't want to interrupt the presentation too much, but I did want to ask um, you to elaborate a bit more on the land cost piece. Yeah. Um, because I think it's important to note how our regulations impact land costs. Mm -hmm. So I frequently have the um, situation in my ward where, well, I have a situation in my ward where our land use policies say something, the zoning doesn't really, I mean, a lot of projects require rezonings, probably to be consistent with our land use plans and guidance. But I also have a very common situation where a developer comes and has bought land and can't make their project work under the existing zoning. And so when we rezone it, we make their project work. So in some ways, our, our regulations and our willingness to change our regulations for specific projects affect the cost of land. Absolutely. Um, and we're about to adopt a comprehensive plan, potentially, that goes even further than we have over the last many decades where we've been gradually making it easier and easier to build without requiring anything uh, in terms of, in, of inclusionary zoning. And so um, land cost, I'm sure, is affected by many factors, but our land use regulations and zoning is one of them. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I think this is the key piece of the economics is what's the implication for land, what happens to land prices as we make these policy changes. And unfortunately, the land price is the variable that we have the least good data about. There's not a public database of land transactions that we can access that tells us exactly what the real costs of land are. So the, <clears throat> the kind of pro forma analysis we're doing, we're looking at real projects and what they actually paid for land, but often they paid for it a year or two or even more ago. And so it's, it's a backward looking analysis. Um, what we're seeing, and I, I'm gonna stress, we're seeing this anecdotally, right? But what we're seeing is that land costs have been rising and that developers have been willing to pay significantly more for land on a per unit basis today than they were a year ago or two years ago. Um, and I believe, without much evidence, 
but that's at least partly the result of the, the changes that you've made in the land use policy, that as you've allowed for uh, more density by right and less parking, that the development community has been you know, absorbing that in the form of now we can build more, now we can build higher, now we can build less expensively with the parking, and that allows them to pay more for land. So part of what, uh, so that concession essentially is baked into these numbers. Their ability to do what we're showing here is already assuming some portion of the value that you've contributed by changing the planning. The comprehensive plan itself, um, when we first started this analysis, my thought was that we'd be looking at how much are the proposed changes likely to change the land value. But what I think we've seen is that to a large degree, the changes that you're, comp that you're uh, considering in changing the comprehensive plan are already uh, things that the market is expecting, that you've already signaled very clearly your intention to allow the kind of development that the plan is formalizing. And so as a result, if you wanted to, uh, to use the, the zoning or the parking as an incentive, you'd have to essentially claw back that land value. And, and we've seen that happen in other places, and it's a multi-year process. You'd have to be willing to withstand several years where land didn't transact. Someone who's expecting to get this much for their land will eventually accept lower, but they, they, make, they adjust their expectations up very rapidly and down very slowly. Um, so that's, that's what Stephanie was saying before about our recommendation that you don't really have a good voluntary option here as a result. If, if you were asking us this question five or eight years ago, we could very well have said, here's how you would do a voluntary program that would be uh, powerfully enough incenting developers to take you up on it. But at this point, that doesn't seem like a good option because of the land cost issues. Can it, yeah. Yeah, um, we've seen in uh, the, there, there's not enough academic research about the impact of inclusionary housing, but what research there is shows fairly consistently that over time the cost of complying with the inclusionary policy gets capitalized into lower land values or land values that rise less rapidly than they might otherwise. So what you would expect to see is that at first when you adopt a policy, it's the, the cost of the policies coming straight out of the bottom line of the projects that are on, in the pipeline. But over time, the developers who all face the same increased cost will all negotiate for a lower land price. And we've seen that happen, and it happens regularly. The, the thing that is very difficult to predict is how long it takes for that to happen. It definitely takes years for that to transpire. So the way we do these analyses is we, folk, we, we assume the land cost is gonna stay constant and we look at what's feasible. But what we've seen is in many communities, what's feasible now uh, you know, changes over time as the land market absorbs the impact of the inclusionary and more becomes feasible later, right? So the question is uh, how can you gradually adjust the expectations of landowners and developers rather than a sudden shock? And it's the sudden shock that we're worried about. Okay. Can I just ask about the uh, six percent and the five point nine percent? Yeah. So, um, who who sets that rate, deciding it's feasible? Is that banks who are getting that? Where does that go? Right. Who gets when that it, money? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. No one gets six percent. What happens, or five point nine? What happens is a developer puts some of their own money into a project. They bring in investors, equity investors. Who, who put in some of the money, and then they go to a bank and they borrow some of the money. So the project overall might have a blended you know, rate of return that's 6%, but the distribution of that 6% to different stakeholders in the project is different from project to project. The, the reason the number is important for feasibility is that when a project is going in for that equity investment, they're showing their books to an investor, and the investor is trying to decide uh, both how much return are they going to get individually, but also how risky is this project? How, how aggressive is this developer being in their expectations about how tightly they're going to operate it, et cetera? And so the, the yield number is a, is a quick metric that allows you to compare very different projects that have very different capital structures and very different returns. So you can see sort of on balance over the whole how profitable is the project itself. 
Separately is the question, how much does the investor receive? How much does the developer receive? Right? The investors are receiving returns that are much higher because the banks are receiving returns that are much lower. And the developer's return depends very much on how they capitalized it themselves. Did they put a lot of their own money in? How much risk are they taking? So their returns are going to fluctuate quite a bit. And 6% is not relevant to any of those. Right? It's just the project itself. Are the rents high enough to cover the cost of building it and then some? Does that answer your question? I think it does, and then it makes me curious about how 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 important is that big investment to or that big return on the investment to everybody. Mm -hmm. You're acting like some developers get much less of a return, so they're obviously willing to put in their capital and their investment and get less. And if it's a local investor, are they willing to take less? Mm -hmm. um, and who will pull the plug on it when it? And who won't? And I think there's got to be some variety there's there. There's absolutely variety. It's, it, it seems to me, anecdotally, having looked at the projects that I've looked at, that you do have projects that are funded with local capital that are accepting lower returns than what we're showing. What we focused on is the institutional projects. And the, there's two reasons for that. One is that's where there's the most data. Right? We can actually look up what the yields are for real projects uh, if they're institutionally financed. But <clears throat> the other is that's where a large portion of your units are coming from. This, it's not the biggest number of projects, but it's the biggest number of units. So we're using the return metrics for institutional projects as a proxy for the market as a whole. But Can it's you totally say institutional projects. So so if banks? you are you go you go to a pension fund or uh, some other equity capital source, a, a hedge fund in you know uh, some other. Uh, uh, insurance company, those types of investors are routinely investing a portion of your pension into residential real estate, and they're working in multiple markets across the country, and the, the cities are essentially competing against each other for access to that capital. And so what happens when your market, when the rents are not high enough to support projects, and when development stops here, the, the, the trigger for that will be when the institutional investors start feeling like the yields are too low. When they don't feel like the, the, the projects themselves are, are quite earning enough over what they cost to build that they feel safe putting their money in. And that we don't know when that will happen. But it but it you know is the it's the appropriate thing to be concerned about. The the mom and pop developers will respond at some point after that in all likelihood. But the the sort of leading indicator is when the institutional capital backs off of your market. And we see it happen regularly. There's a, just a regular cycle, and you can expect it to happen again, whatever you do on the inclusionary policy. Yeah, we uh, sometimes I get the sense that maybe some of those institutional investors are less desirable than others, and we hear about oh now we're interest now China's very interested in investing in Minneapolis, and what does that mean, and are they? Uh, yeah, I don't know how, how socially conscious are those institutions going to be about what's even happening here. So yeah, interesting. All right, let me um, move through, and I think that's a it's a good line of conversation. So hopefully we can continue that afterwards. But let me just show you the rest of our analysis. <clears throat> so then uh, we felt that uh, it was worth looking at other levels of affordability. So we stepped down from 15 to 10, and what you see at 10 percent is that in the, in the strong market and the downtown neighborhoods, we have now kind of a margin of error. There's a, their pro projects are profitable enough that, that I'm not as worried about uh, what happens in the market cycle, et cetera. When the market's completely down, these projects won't happen either. But, I, but this is the level of comfort that you'd like to see to feel like your inclusionary policy isn't going to be preventing feasible projects from moving forward. However, even at 10% affordable, you'll notice in the emerging market neighborhoods, we just barely squeak into the marginal category. And so even at a 10% citywide requirement, we're concerned that there would be projects that could get built today that wouldn't be built under this policy. They're, they're more localized. There are only certain places and only certain projects, but there's still likely to be a meaningful number of them. You can go down to 5% affordability, and then we don't have that problem anymore. At 5%, every project is a little bit less profitable, but the feasible projects are all still feasible. The marginal projects are all still marginal. But 5% is not a very big number. You're not going to get a lot of units, and it's going to feel like a lot of work for the number of units you get. So this is why we concluded before that incentives were an important thing for you to consider. Um, we looked at a lot of different incentives. Stephanie talked about the sort of planning incentives, density, parking. 
Um, what we are focusing on is the tax increment financing, which is basically cash from the city. The tax increment financing, I'm sure you're all familiar with, maybe more so than I am, but the, the, the Minnesota allows you to offer a project uh, the ability to share in or to sort of rebate back the uh, increase in taxes that they would pay when they put a new project on. When we build a multi-story residential project on a parking lot, the taxes are much higher. We can put some of that money back into the deal and essentially buy down the rents. So it's like a tenant subsidy. We're going to pay for some portion of the cost. And what we looked at in this scenario was uh, if we provided each of these projects with the maximum allowable TIF, which is a 25-year period, and we gave them all of the increase in tax benefit that we projected, um, how profitable would the projects be? And you'll see they're all more profitable than what we started with. Unfortunately, that's not a very realistic view of the impact of TIF because it leaves out some other costs. So when, when you use the, uh, the TIF program in Minnesota, uh, in Minneapolis, you, in addition to providing affordable housing, you also have to provide jobs. And you have a prevailing wage requirement. You have procurement requirements that all add to cost. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly how much. We looked at a number of different projects, some of which used your, TIF, your existing TIF program and had to pay the prevailing wage, we weren't able to, dis to discern a pattern in the cost per unit between the TIF projects and the non-TIF projects, but there absolutely certainly is one. We just don't have enough data points to say exactly how much the difference was. So just for the sake of exploring the impact, we looked at what if we assume that there's a 10% increase. It's absolutely possible that for, for many projects, the difference between building with prevailing wage and building without prevailing wage could be more than 10%. And for other projects, it might be less. But just as, a, as an exercise, we said, what happens if we build the, the TIF required 20% uh, of the units at 50% of median, and we pay 10% more for the cost of construction than we would have in our base models? And under that scenario, all of the projects that were feasible before are still feasible and all of the projects that were marginal are still marginal. So it doesn't make the emerging market neighborhoods suddenly super profitable. They'll still be challenging to develop in, but it allows you to get 20% affordable at 50% of median without changing dramatically the feasibility, which projects are feasible and which are not. We're not suggesting that you give all of these projects the maximum amount of TIF. And one of the key things that Stephanie's going to talk about in a minute is the administrative burden of managing how much TIF each project gets. But we're expecting that projects would get TIF based on their demonstrated need and their actual return, that you'd, you'd audit uh, how much TIF they needed to be feasible. And many of the projects wouldn't need any, and they would move forward. But the projects that needed it to be feasible would have a place to go so that you wouldn't have as much worry that the policy was going to undermine the feasibility of otherwise feasible projects. So I'm going to stop there and let Stephanie talk about our policy recommendations based on that, and then we'll take questions. Thanks, Rick. So home stretch here. Uh, so you'll recall the reason we did this financial feasibility analysis to inform these additional policy choices for your policy. Uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about this last policy choice on the list, which is should your policy be the same citywide or varied? Um, so this is back to Rick's initial slide about, you know, what does development feasibility look like even without affordability, even today? And, you know, you can see that in the stronger market areas, rents are higher, they could support a higher affordable housing requirement, fewer incentives. In the emerging and softer markets, rents are lower, support a lower requirement or need more incentives. How do you design a policy when you have these varied markets, right? Well, there are a couple options. Uh, so you could do a geographically varied policy, right? You take out the map, you draw the lines, right? These are the stronger market areas with a higher requirement. These are the weaker market areas with a lower requirement, uh, as Seattle did. Uh, there are some downsides to that. Uh, the biggest one being the process of drawing that map can be very time consuming and very politically fraught. You can imagine a landowner coming in who's just on the higher requirement side of your proposed line. Uh, also, market conditions change over time, right? Neighborhoods are going to shift in terms of what's feasible, and then you might find yourself needing to redraw your lines every few years and go through the process again. Uh, it can also take a bunch of staff time to administer a program that has different requirements in different places. And even after all that work, 
you know, that may still fail to take into account some of the finer grain differences in project economics among projects. So is there another way? There is. Uh, you can also address the differences in housing markets by having a citywide program where projects have multiple options for how they can comply. Right, so if you look at this example from Chicago, let's say you know developers in a softer market neighborhood where this first alternative, 10% affordable with no public subsidy, just wouldn't pencil for them, they have the option of falling back to the second alternative, getting the public subsidy and getting the project to work with more affordability. And on the other hand, you know, in a stronger market area, it may be more appealing for developers to just go with alternative one, straight shot, 10% affordable, don't need any public subsidies. You're not relying on public resources. So I just talked about this fourth policy choice. Uh, and then rather than walk through these other three one by one, I'm just going to jump right ahead into three policy options from Minneapolis that kind of address all four of these considerations. So here they are. Option one mirrors the th thing we just talked about in Chicago. Uh, two choices for how to comply, 10% with no subsidy, 20% with subsidy. Option two would be a geographically targeted program where you draw those lines on the map. Uh, in this option, we're suggesting just a straight shot requirement with no public subsidy available anywhere. So you'd have a high requirement, maybe up to 15% in the stronger market areas and a much lower requirement like 5% elsewhere in the city. And then the third option is kind of a hybrid of the two. So uh, in stronger market areas, you could just say, here's your requirement, whatever it might be, 10, 15%, no subsidy. Uh, but elsewhere in the city, projects do have the option to use public subsidy and you can get more affordable housing in those areas. Let me walk through some pros and cons of each of these options. So one thing we love about policy option number one is that you don't have to go through the process of drawing those boundaries and maintaining geographic boundaries over time. Uh, another benefit is that it does provide a real choice for how to comply, and that makes it more likely that your inclusionary housing policy will work for more projects rather than projects having to choose to not go forward at all. Um, and it also provides alternatives, you know, if you have developers who have different experience with things like public finance requirements, they can choose an option where they don't have to deal with that. Uh, another advantage is that policy option one may respond to changing market conditions more quickly. So you could imagine that in a time when it becomes more difficult to build, more projects are gonna to lean toward alternative two, take advantage of public subsidy, continue to move forward. In a time when it's easier to build, more projects are gonna to lean toward alternative one, go forward in that direction. Uh, another advantage that is dear to my heart is um, projects that use public subsidy are allowed to have an affordability term of up to 30 years uh, for those affordable units, as opposed to the maximum 20 year period that's allowed without public subsidy. So there's an advantage for projects that use the subsidy. Uh, the downsides of this option both have to do with the subset of projects that take advantage of public subsidy. Uh, it does take some administrative burden from staff to look on a project by project basis and determine, well, how much subsidies does this project really need? Also, if you do use TIF as your subsidy mechanism, the process of setting up the TIF district not only is kind of an administrative burden on staff, but it can also take several months, which means it might take uh, longer for projects to move forward than it otherwise would take. But there may well be good opportunities to streamline those processes, which could significantly reduce the extent of those disadvantages. Oh, and before I get to pros and cons of policy options two and three, I just want to flag that if you go with policy option two or three, you will have to make a decision about what the affordable housing set aside is for those strong market areas. Um, we've used the phrase up to 15% uh, because I think we really see 15% as the very outer limit maximum of what could possibly be considered feasible. Rick talked a lot about the need for a margin of error in these type of policies, and uh, we really think that you know a lower uh, requirement would leave you that margin of error and make sure the policy makes sense through different parts of the market cycle. We covered that pretty well. So policy option two, drawing your boundaries, strict requirements, no subsidy. One of the advantages, doesn't require city subsidy, right? You're not using government resources for affordable housing, you're just capturing the value of the market. Uh, also, it doesn't have kind of the administrative uh, and potential project-related delays related to using subsidy and TIF. Big downside to this policy option is the process of drawing and maintaining those uh, boundaries on a map. Um, slightly less affordable housing produced in those emerging market areas, so 5% with this option as opposed to 20% with policy option one. Uh, and then, since none of the projects will use subsidy, 
everyone will be limited to only 20 years of affordability. And then option three is our hybrid program, which also has a hybrid of pros and cons. Um, it provides a good balance of projects that receive subsidy versus those that don't compared to the amount of affordable units produced. Uh, and because fewer projects here will use subsidy because no projects in the smaller market areas have access to it, it means you'll have less of those subsidy related downsides. Of course, you still have to draw your boundaries and maintain your boundaries. Uh, affordability terms still limited to 20 years for those projects that use subsidy. Um, with, I'm sorry, for those projects that don't use subsidy, which will be most of your projects, right, since now we're not allowing subsidy in the stronger market areas. And then interestingly, um, there will be a set of projects that even though they're in stronger market areas, the rents are lower, they don't pencil out as well, they would want the opportunity to use subsidy in order to move forward. Under policy option one, they would have that opportunity. Under this policy option, they wouldn't have that opportunity, so some projects just wouldn't move forward in those stronger market areas. So I think, oh yeah, so what do we recommend? <laughs> I'm guessing you could probably imagine where we're going with this based on my previous slides. And indeed, uh, Grounded Solutions Network recommends that Minneapolis design a policy focused around policy option one with multiple alternatives for compliance. Um, this balances housing production, administrative burden, public subsidy, while also not getting into the complications of geographic boundaries. And uh, that is basically it. I do want to flag that um, what we've put forward in terms of our report uh, is enough to inform kind of the basics of an inclusionary housing policy, but there's still more work that needs to be done to get to a full adopted policy and an implementable program, uh, including, among other things, developing recommendations for homeownership projects. Uh, so our forthcoming report, which should be out in mere weeks, has some more details on what we just presented and also talks a little bit more about kind of what it's going to take to cross the finish line to get this thing moving forward. Uh, but as Andrea mentioned, what we have now can inform a policy framework to be considered concurrent with the comp plan, and then we can do more work in 2019. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Thank you very much. I want to make sure that this presentation is also online, tied to our agenda, and also that report when it comes out would be nice if it was also tied to this agenda as well, so it was there to read it. And there was a 2016 report that's mm -hmm. published somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can also link that here too so people can have access to that. Um, I appreciate the presentation. I just have one little question and then I think we have some more discussion. You talked a lot about the 20-year um, limit on affordability and the 30-year. Is that in the same statute, um, 462, um, that gives us the authority? Because it I wasn't quite getting why if we have uh, the authority yeah. based on a site plan approval to require something, then it all evaporates. Most of our, the things we put in that site plan approval or the yeah. PUD, um, they stay with the project. Yeah, this so there, there are two statutes. Uh, 462, which gives you that authority, specifically says uh, limits affordability to, I forget which is which, but one of them limits affordability to 20 years unless public subsidy is involved. And then there's another statute which just says by default, you can't go above 30 years, or vice versa. But there are two different statutes that really clearly lay that out, including this one. It just seems like um, that's really unfortunate, because then it's we're constantly playing catch up, unless we have property owners that are really willing to, um, yeah. you know, toe the line. But often they aren't. So it's very unfortunate. We're going to be investing all this money in it, and then it's going to be gone. So we should fix that state law. Okay. Here, here. Thank you. Get on it. Um, Council Member Bender, I think, was first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make a quick comment, and then I have some questions, and I'm sure other council members do too. Um, I've been working on this policy for a number of years, and I'm really appreciative of the openness of council members to engage in this. The details are really, they really matter. And when Grounded Solutions came in 2016, they actually briefed every single member of the council who was in office last term, um, and folks took the time to really dig into those details. And so um, my goal with this policy has been to create one more tool that we have as a city to get affordable units. I don't think anyone should pretend, and I don't want to pretend that this is, you know, an overall solution to our affordability problem. It is just one of, of many tools, and probably one that of all of the options isn't going to create like the most units, right? Um, but I do think it's really important 
to meet another goal, which is to have mixed income communities and not leave out folks from places that are rapidly, rapidly developing. And when we have the presentation at this committee of the um, census tracts that are gentrifying the fastest, they are those that have the most new construction. And it was one indicator of, um, and, and, and how that study defined gentrification um, of the way that where we have um, in our city, we have developed almost all of the new housing in a very, very small percentage of our total land, um, mostly in the third ward recently, in the second ward, the 10th ward uh, near the university. Um, so a lot of our housing is going into a very small part of our land area and a lot of the new population growth. And, and those aren't, haven't included affordable units so far. Um, so I think this is an opportunity to do so. Um, I, it's very important that I just wanna highlight that so much care has gone into not exacerbating our supply problem. We have a 2% rental vacancy rate in Minneapolis. And I just don't wanna lose sight of the problem that if you talk to renter advocates who are organizing low-income renters in our city, they will note that their jobs have gotten significantly harder as our rental market has tightened that the supply problem is causing issues for renters, particularly the most vulnerable low-income renters in our city. And a supply, it's like increasing our housing supply and continuing to add needed housing units is a really important part of that puzzle too. And that is felt very strongly in my ward where 80% of people are renters. And then I also think it's important that our policy be predictable and fair. And that's why I really support this notion that we're using a policy that is um, as easy to follow as possible that is applying across the city and isn't assuming that neighborhoods that are more affordable now are gonna stay that way in the future. That we're looking at every single neighborhood in the city and planning for as long term as we can under state law currently, affordability in every single neighborhood in our city. So I think that the presentation has been designed to address these goals and it's our job as policymakers to figure out if we're, if we're there yet or not. I did wanna say that um, the timeline of this has also been important in conjunction with the comp plan. So I have a staff direction to offer today um, that I worked on with council members Fletcher and Schrader to just make sure that we're being clear about our timeline and, and we've worked on this very closely with staff that we would have something ready to go when we're voting on the comprehensive plan and there's two phases to this. So I wanted to ask our CPUD staff to come and talk about this a little bit um, because there's this kind of strange period of time between when we vote on our draft or our, what will be our then final comprehensive plan, which we're required to do this year, we'll be doing that by the end of this year. And then, you know, the next step is the Metropolitan Council has to approve it and then we'll be updating our zoning code. And so uh, we will have a, a new land use map that will say, hey, we wanna have six story buildings on Lindale Avenue or on Lake Street or whatever it might say. Um, and the current zoning may not be exactly what the land use plan says. So I would expect we're gonna to continue to have rezoning applications in this weird window of time. And so I just wondered if you could talk about that and how that's informed our plan for inclusionary zoning. Sure. Mr. Chair, Council okay. President Bender and uh, committee members, thank you for, uh, for your patience today. Uh, there's been a lot of staff led by our housing director, Andrea Brennan, who have worked very hard on this and we appreciate your efforts uh, and your colleagues' efforts. So Council President, to your, uh, to your question, just first quickly, if I may, on the timing, right? So I believe uh, from your staff direction, it will be clear that we intend to work subject to the committee and the council's approval, uh, work for the rest of this year to design uh, first an interim, and this is the most responsive part to your question, first an interim policy that you could vote on at the same time that you vote on the comp plan in early December, and that we would uh, be back at that same time later this year with a framework for the permanent policy. Now, why a framework? Isn't it, you know, it's kind of clear today, we, we know what we want. There are lots of the mechanics, lots of the legal aspects, and lots of the particulars to make our programs work so that when we say we are open for business, that we actually are. Because if it's a market rate project that would otherwise not have included affordability, we take very seriously not overly slowing down the market at the same time that we need to uh, do, do what we can to make sure development is still happening, okay? So we need to take the rest of this year, we intend to take the rest of this year to design, uh, I'll call it an interim policy for you to vote on at the same time as the comp plan. And then at that same time, we'd offer a framework for the permanent policy. And then we would be back in 2019 
with those blanks filled in, in what I'm now calling a framework, for you to adopt, uh, for it to take full effect. And interestingly, the timing kind of works, right? So you'll vote on the comp plan in December, and then we will submit it in January to the Metropolitan Council. They have something like a year, if I'm saying that right, um, to get back to us to say, yes, we agree. This is, you know, we had, uh, we had, uh, we ratify, not sure the verb, the comp plan, and then the council will vote again, okay? So during that time, we will come up with the permanent, the blanks in the framework that you would have voted on in December. So we'd be back later this year for your staff direction with both an interim policy that would be in effect for let's just call it 2019, and then a permanent policy as well, a framework for a permanent policy. Council President, to your question, the, uh, that interim policy would address the situation where come February, the council has voted for the comp plan, has said on Lindale, or today, this size project is possible, and as of the comp plan being voted on by you, there's an understanding that you support a bigger project, a denser project, a taller project for any given place, and a developer wants to take advantage of that, that in that circumstance where something more than you could build today, but that the new comp plan would say was okay, would trigger this interim policy. Okay, so we will spend a few months coming up with how exactly would that work, and what would we require for your review and approval later this year? Um, do you think we would be ready to go with the, any TIF portion of a policy for that interim period, or do you think we'll probably land on more of a regulatory um, approach to the interim period? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council President Bender, I, uh, I, we're not sure enough, let me say it like that, that we'll be ready by later this year with a subsidy, call it a TIF piece of the interim policy that we should commit to it now. This, um, this also might be an opportunity for committee members to weigh in with their opinion on that. And also, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Pomisano. Thanks for being here. Feel free to weigh in if you want as well. I think it also might be interesting to hear if folks um, have any thoughts on the recommended option that we got from Grounded Solutions? Um, Council Member Trader. Well, I just want to thank Grounded Solutions for all their work, but also the, the Council President for all their work over this time and such. Uh, kind of a, a critical, big policy, uh, and especially also the, the Department for all their work over the years. Uh, I'm, I'm very much in favor of a, a, a citywide solution. Uh, we have a citywide affordability problem. We need a solution that's going to mimic that. Um, I also kind of agree with a lot of the council president's uh, comments. This is not the solution. We still need to make sure that we're producing more housing and preserving what we have. Um, and I really need something that's going to work, you know, also in my ward, this mainly single family where we have great housing stock, but the market isn't hot. How are we going to say uh, that when you're building in our community, you must reflect community values? And I, that's what I love about this policy is uh, it really puts us in that direction. And I look forward to working on it for the future. Councilmember Ellison. <clears throat> uh, I want to thank Ronald Solutions for coming through and giving us the presentation. Um, you know, I think that this has been something uh, since getting elected just in the past couple of months. All of us have been sort of dealing with that, that initial question that you posed at the front of the presentation, which was, do you do something voluntary? Do you make it uh, mandatory? I think that at, at a gut level, a lot of us have known, like, we need a policy that is, uh, that, that, that isn't voluntary. Um, and so to see that, um, you know, sort of, uh, the work that you all did kind of like affirms that was uh, was, was encouraging, uh, and I'm also in favor of a citywide policy. I think that when you, uh, you know, I believe some of the work that that uh, uh, Kira, um, the Center for Urban and Regional Affairs over at the U of M, has done around gentrification in North Minneapolis, is where which is where I represent. Uh, we're seeing, um, you know, gentrification in some of those uh, edge neighborhoods that are closest to downtown, um, kind of being taken over. We've we've seen. Um, uh, you know, even even marketing groups who want to rebrand <laughs> streets and, and communities and that kind of thing, right? Uh, and so having a policy that affirms that, like, we do uh, have some understanding of what's coming down some of our major transit corridors and that kind of thing, uh, and we're not going to be, um, you know, sort of agnostic, agnostic or ambivalent about uh, development in in our communities uh, is, is really important. So I um, want to thank um, uh, the council president and 
uh, Councilmember Schrader and Fletcher for you know leading on this, and then thank you to staff for all the heavy lifting um, and and hopefully getting us to, to implementation. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to weigh in, Councilmember Wright? All right. I, I appreciate the uh, the recommendation. Oh, Councilmember Bender. Can I ask one more question? Of course, uh, as many you, as you want. This is really a detailed question, and it's not really for ready for prime time, so my apologies to staff. But we have been talking about this idea that rather than subsidize the development per se, that we um, look at ways to subsidize rent. Um, and just that is literally the question starting point we're at. And I wondered if other cities have taken that kind of approach. I think it could mean a lot of different things. And like I said, staff is really still working out the details um, of what we might even consider what that might mean. Um, but one thing it might mean is the financing of a typical market rate development project might change, <laughs> might not change as much. Um, if we use TIF on, on, a, on sort of the back end of a project instead of the financing of a project, it might be, it could potentially be a meaningful way for us to center the tenants and the renters in the building and our policy. Um, so I just wondered if other cities have thought of that or if anyone's doing something like that. Thank you for the question, Council President. Um, there's an analogous uh, dynamic. I'm, I think the question that needs further research is how you would use TIF specifically in that context. Mm -hmm. What we see in some cities is uh, the housing vouchers used in that way, where a city requires a developer to provide affordable units under an inclusionary policy, but then allows for the use of vouchers for some portion of those units. And generally what happens is you get a deeper level of affordability than you would have, you know, if they'd just done it without the voucher. So it's the, I think that the, what you're saying about the project financing not having to look very different if you're using the vouchers is true. There's administrative challenges with the vouchers. And I suspect there'll be administrative challenges to using TIF in a similar way. But in terms of the overall financial feasibility, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. The, the, the basic economics are if we're going to have some small number of affordable units, the development can absorb it. If we're gonna have a larger number, there has to be a additional subsidy to help make that work. And you could tie that to the project through the tenant instead of as an upfront development, if you can do it legally. That won't change the economics. Could I just ask, do you think then that would um, make the requirement go longer than 20 years? Could we tie the requirement to accept and use the vouchers in perpetuity? No, not as far as I understand. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not equipped to give you legal advice, but that's, that's not how I would understand it. Did you have a, yeah, Councilman Wilson. Uh, I just wanted to really um, sort of affirm uh, what Councilmember Gordon said with the fact that we are going to be, we do put a lot of money into affordable housing and the fact that we're sort of restricted because, you know, municipal governments are creatures of the state. Um, you know, we're restricted in, 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 in making that affordability perpetual, but, um, you know, just want to remind folks out who are listening in the public that it's election year and that state laws <laughs> change and that, uh, you know, we can kind of move forward and, and, and assert uh, that if we are going to be the entity that puts uh, so much time and energy and money into building this affordability, then we should have some say uh, that affordability that that affordability be perpetual. Uh, and so I hope that the advocates are are noting that, and that the you know we, um, it could be kind of it can kind of suck to have to deal with the intergovernmental layer cake. But um, I think it's important, um, and and I, I'd certainly be more than willing to advocate and fight for that at the state level, um, or or you know engage our our legal team at the city to create some creative workarounds. So anyway, just wanted to note that. Excellent, Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna offer a couple of final thoughts. First, I just really, really wanted to thank our staff who've been working on this a lot. And I know they have so many other priorities. Um, so, and this is a complex policy that has a lot of different elements um, and grounded solutions for all your work too. And I just want to say to the stakeholders, I mean, part of the reason we wanted to do things this way was to give time to dig into these details. There are a lot of detailed assumptions in the calculations that were presented today, and we welcome feedback from all the different stakeholders that have been engaged. 
Um, I wanted to note the importance of this interim period and just remind folks that we don't have to make it easier to develop in Minneapolis and we get a lot of um, feedback about that when we when we go in that direction. And so we may end up with an interim period of time where we are requiring affordable units in projects that otherwise couldn't be built unless we took action as a council. And I think that's um, appropriate considering where we are as a city and how much we have done to support more housing, obviously we need more. And I think that this council overall has has um, embraced the idea that housing supply is an important part of the puzzle, but we also need to make sure that we're planning for this long-term affordability. So we know these next few years are gonna be awkward as we you know, contemplate the draft comprehensive plan, as we take our action as a council, as we wait for the Metropolitan Council to review and adopt it, as we look, work to, um, you know, implement all of the changes that are needed to bring that plan to life over many years. And I think we're all going to do our best to meet all of the all of the different goals that we have. So I just really thank everyone for their continued involvement. And then we know that we're, you know, we've worked on this for a long time, but this is really just a starting and beginning and it may be awkward for a few years here. So thank you all very much. Now, um, you said closing comments, but I'm not sure if we've officially had the uh, staff direction moved or described before us? I don't believe that we have. Um, would you like to move that, Council Member Bender? Sure, I, um, like, thank you very much. I'd love to move this staff direction um, by myself and Council Member Fletcher, who was here and I know had to leave, and Council Member Schrader. Um, and it has three parts. There are some copies available with the clerk. And this is a direction to CPAD to return to this committee in November with the recommended amendments to our unified housing policy to support an inclusionary zoning ordinance. The second piece is to prepare a zoning code text amendment um, that would go through our regular process to bring forward interim inclusionary zoning uh, controls or an ordinance. And that would apply to projects that would um, need some sort of um, change to substantially increase the allowable residential development capacity on the project site. And then this would take place starting in January 1st of 2019 until we had a final ordinance. And then the third piece is to come back in November with a recommended framework for the long-term plan that we know will need more work in 2019. And that would be to, um, that the framework would bring recommendations that apply citywide and be feasible as recommended by our consultants. I will move that very detailed staff direction. Welcome comments or questions. Thank you very much. I guess I want, um, the way I read it, the third point is that you are pushing okay. our staff towards option one. Um, and, and I'm not sure if that's clear. It says citywide and be feasible as recommended by a third party consultant. Um, my inclination is to think that made a lot of sense. I, I have reasons why I like that approach. I think it, that were articulated well by the consultant. And is that kind of the intention? Yes, I mean, so I think that's a fair um, assessment of the, but this is a little broader than that and leaves a little more open-ended, but yes, that it is taking some of the elements out of that recommend, recommendation, including particularly the citywide piece uh, and, the, and the project feasibility piece. Yeah, and yeah. I think that, I mean, that word feasible is sort of, I think meant to be not, def it's not defined here. I just wanna be clear that that's not defined here. Well, I support the staff direction. I also support the concept of um, having some funding, having recognizing that there's gonna be some, some incentive, some, some subsidy that might, that we would be able to use to increase um, the affordability. And maybe I'm reading into what's feasible there, but I, I like, I'm happy to support this as it is. And just noting my opinion for the record here. Any other comments on the motion? Then on the staff direction, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion carries. And I also will move to receive and file our report and presentation with the feasibility analysis and options. Seeing no discussion on that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. That motion carries as well. And I think that concludes our business today. Thank you everybody for being here. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>